Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Nandish, and today I will be helping you all in understanding what um, a research paper is and how to write a good research paper. So first of all, we need to know that you have a paper called um, Industrial and Organizational Psychology, which is paper number six, and you have uh, 80 marks of uh, studying from the textbook, and the remaining 20 marks it is um, it is from the project that you will do that is the IO project and uh, this IO project contains the research paper which is which you have to write by your own and during my time it was something that I had to do individually from my class but at the same time I had been provided uh, help from one of my seniors so that I could do uh, much more uh, you know complex uh, kind of measurements and calculations in it so what is research? Research is basically uh, all around us. Whenever you open uh, any tabs in your uh, um, browser or anywhere if you want to search something, there is always some kind of scientific evidence uh, there is. Suppose uh, there is a person who is suffering from schizophrenia. Then what is it that the person might have experienced in the child which led to the predisposition or the vulnerable factor that led the person to develop schizophrenia? And uh, talking about IO, there, is, uh, there are several variables that are present. And do let me know if you all don't get it or if there is any word that you all don't understand. Because by far, this is the most uh, complex task. This is the most uh, you know, uh, engaging task. If you are interested in it, it will be very uh, good for your own learning. You will gain a lot of practical knowledge by doing this research. So uh, research, yeah. Uh, do you all have any questions till now? If you all uh, do have any queries, any doubts, do let me know. Feel free to ask. So I'll move on accordingly. All right. So an example of a research. So there are many psychological phenomena that are all around us. Say, what effect does uh, caffeine has on sleep or the number of hours a person sleeps? So if there are 30, pe uh, 30 people in your class, then I will divide it into two groups, 15 uh, in each group. And one group, I will, um, you know, I will introduce an inter uh, independent variable, the caffeine. And by this caffeine, what effect does it have on your sleep? So I will measure that. So one group is called the control group and the other group is called the experimental group. All right. Which you will uh, further, you know. Yeah. So there are a lot of sites that are available for uh, seeing research papers and Google is not by far the best because there are several uh, research papers that are available to you. Suppose you want to find something on, say, histri histrionic personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder. Or the former one, the histrionic one is more common in females, whereas the narcissistic one is more common in males. How do we know this? Because of research. So if you want to study more about it, it's better to go on certain websites that will help you in gaining adequate knowledge about um, the subject you want to study. Right. So as you can see in the second paragraph, there are all these um, websites, ResearchGate, Google Scholar, uh, Microsoft Academic, uh, Science.gov. There are also some Indian ones which uh, are quite good, like Shodh Ganga and all. And OK, now we come on to how to write a research paper. Till now, do you all have any questions? Do you all want to ask anything? You can just unmute yourself because I can't see anyone right now because I'm presenting. Uh, Takreem, has that girl come? The one? Uh... Yes, yes. All right. So everyone is here, right? I'll just message me. Uh, accept the new uh, admission who's Ashish. He has not joined. Oh, it's all right. Okay, so how to write a research paper? So I will uh, first explain you what, uh, uh, you know, how a research paper is written, what are the main components of it, what are the main uh, structures of a research paper. Then I will show you my own personal research paper, which I had presented in Bangalore virtually, of course, because of COVID. And uh, yeah, so don't be in a hurry to, you know, jot down everything of, which is on the PPT because I will be sharing it with you as well as my research paper. 
All right. So before we begin, we need to first know what is a research paper's primary aim. As I already said that the primary aim is to find out the relationship or how some variables are, uh, you know, interrelated or correlated. So if I want to find uh, is depression and um, alcoholism co comorbid, which it is, which means that if a person is more, uh, say, depressed, then they are also more likely to uh, have a problem of alcohol. So it is more seen in males. That is the reason why depression is more common in females, because when men get stressed, they um, usually when I, I mean uh, older men, uh, men above the age of, uh, say, 27, 30, and they tend to retort to, uh, say, certain kinds of uh, substances that help them in coping with the stress and depression is that's the reason why that's one of the major reasons why depression is seen in uh, seen more in females so yeah uh, so the topic for the research that was a, one of the examples of what a topic of a research can be the next one is the variables what are the variables that you are studying so uh, in my semester five i did a research paper on resilience and job stress this word might be new for you resilience uh, i will uh, soon explain to it uh, explain it to you um, because i need to show my research paper for that a sample and population anybody knows the difference between sample and population it's all right even if you uh, don't know you can just try if you've heard somewhere of, or if you've read somewhere in your books okay uh, population i guess is the number of people that the population is too much but a yes. certain amount of people that we yes. conduct the experiment on conduct the research on that is known as a sample yes very good so population so population is something suppose i want to do a, do a research and i want to focus on a certain group of population maybe it is from maybe it is a geriatric population if people between the age range of 65 and up and i want to study how they so behave in a particular way or if there is certain kind of disorder that comes in maybe alzheimer's parkinson's so there are lakhs and lakhs of people in india who belong to this geriatric population but it is not feasible for me to conduct an entire research on all of them so what i do is i select a particular group of people from the population and do so in a random way so that uh, yeah because there are several other factors which can play a role if you select a particular group of population a certain way it does have an impact on the results you will find so this is population the population is a bigger set and sample is a subset of it next the purpose of the study uh yeah so we'll just move ahead with this this minute yeah oh it's not there uh, the purpose of the study what is it that you want to find what is the relationship that you are looking out for? What is the factor that you're considering? What is uh, the objective of your research? Maybe it is for some clinical purposes. Maybe it is for some, um, maybe uh, say on a very large scale, like uh, census or anything like that. Uh, then comes the hypothesis of your study. Does anyone know what a hypothesis is? Okay. It's a prediction to what you think uh, might be the outcome. Yes, correct. Uh, hypothesis is basically an assumption, a prediction that I make, okay, uh, between any variables. So suppose I'm studying about uh, work environment, how a work environment can shape a person's level of motivation. So I can make a hype. Sorry. I mean, I can make a hypothesis which states that a good work environment can also uh, can increase the amount of motivation that an employee feels towards doing his or her job. So that is a hypothesis. It is an assumption. And to test this assumption, I do the research. All right. And then it is the um, process of the the process in which we collect the data. So these are the basic steps. These are very, very important steps in writing a research paper. These steps are always present. There are also some steps, smaller steps that are also present, but these are the main steps that uh, you need to focus very much on. And we will see each of them in the further slides. So first, first is the abstract. Now, look, we have reached the point where we've started to, we've started to uh, see how a research paper begins and how it ends. So the very first part of a research paper is the abstract. 
so uh, if you want to read about anything if you want to read someone's research paper there is an abstract abstract is basically a summary of the entire paper so you don't need to read the entire paper you can just read the abstract of it and an abstract must have certain features it does not need to be very long and it does not need to be very concise and precise mentioning each and everything mentioning each and every uh, step that you've taken it just needs to be a small summary of it so the basic design of the study which you will also uh, be taught by your teachers what are designs of study random then uh, different different kinds of studies and their designs major findings of trends that is uh, what did you find out what were the results that you obtained by doing this research so is it something that you had hypothesized and it is correct then accept the hypothesis then uh, there is a brief summary of what are your interpretations and what are conclusions so the person who is reading it knows what you have found out and how it can be uh, helpful to the person who is reading it all right keywords is something that i will show you in my research paper um okay so now we come to the introduction introduction is uh, where you formally introduce what is your research about so in my study there was resilience and job stress i wanted to find resilience is basically uh, in a short way it's you know uh, when you are under stress and you want to get out of it then if you are a resilient person then it can surely help you if you stretch a rubber band too much and then you let it loose then uh, the rubber band gains its original shape its original size and that property of any object any person is called as resilience if uh, two people are met with an accident then we observe that sometimes one person is able to make a better recovery out of it and it is faster it is within a few weeks or a few months whereas some other people they do not uh, get out of the treatment very easily they need to spend a lot of time a lot of efforts into it and this property that uh, helps certain individuals to uh, maybe cope with stress deal with their environment in a more effective way is called as resilience all right i hope i have explained it well to you because it is something that is very much necessary if you are conducting a uh, research you need to very well know your variables okay and it needs to be short it doesn't need to be very long just one or one or one and a half pages then there is literature review literature review is uh, whenever you do a study you also study about you go online you study about the uh, other researchers who have done the same kind of study as you are doing so you have to review it you have to see what they found out using the same variables and uh, literature review also needs to be uh, you know quite widespread but not very long is everything clear till now or do you all want me to repeat anything okay yeah as i said you need to uh make it very concise but not very long but there are certain things that you have to mention in your literature review for instance what was the name of the researcher what was the title of the paper when was it done the sample size and the population and what it was it that they found out doing the research which you are doing as well all right then comes the methodology and in this you have to first introduce what your objective is what your aim is that is for me it was to study the impact of resilience on job stress in employees that if a person was resilient enough then uh, does he or she experience lower amounts of job stress or there are some kind of protective beneficial effects of resilience on an employee yeah so this is the aim you have to define what is it that you're doing and uh, what are the variables in it then comes the variables you have to make sure that you uh, formally in, uh, introduce your variables that these and these are my variables sometimes you have more than two variables and how are they related maybe they are subsets of each other you can explain it uh, in this part then there are types of variables independent and dependent variable which we call in psychology as iv and dv so can anyone just give a try to what these are just maybe whatever you know or maybe with an example if you have been very thorough with it 
because this is something which we learned in uh, FY and uh, this is a very primary phenomena which we will need to have a very good clarity of while conducting research, IV and DV. Uh, independent variable is a variable that we use to fluctuate. So this is something that we will keep changing accordingly. And the effects of independent variable on some other variable is the one that is dependent variable that will change according to our independent variable. Yes, very good. Uh, so independent variable is the one which experimenter manipulates manipulates in order to see what effect does it have on the dependent variable in my case what effect is caffeine or drinking coffee say one hour before sleep have on the number of hours a person sleeps the number of hours becomes a dependent variable this is the easiest uh, definition of or explaining how uh, independent and dependent variable are interrelated Okay, as we mentioned, hypothesis. Hypothesis is the relationship you assume between the relationships which you test in your research is hypothesis. And there are many types of hypothesis uh, which are present in my research paper, which I will explain to you there. This is sample size. Uh, I'm showing this to you because you need to formally understand what all of these concepts are because each and every single uh, topic is mentioned in my research paper as well as it should be present in yours as well so you have to formally introduce each and every thing to the reader the person who will read your uh, research paper okay so as we already know that population is a bigger part it can be an age group it can be a gender it can be any other factor which you are taking into consideration it can be number of people who are depressed with say postpartum depression or a number of people who have a paranoid schizophrenia or anything and the sample is a percentage of people you take maybe in a psychiatric facility or maybe in some clinical setting you take these people out to study how the disorder they have or what kind of condition it is that is affecting them and their surroundings in a way that they think the, the way they feel and the way they behave next is the procedure so we already saw these uh, we already saw the first uh, three and the fourth one is collecting the data actually uh, maybe going out or because of covid you can do it virtually you collect the data you send them questionnaires you send them google forms so that they can uh, you know put in their answers or maybe select something on a likert scale or uh, maybe given their uh, subjective responses, it depends on that. But most of the time, times it is uh, something that they have to select from from the uh, responses that are available. That that's the ones we provide. Okay, one, two, seven, and select any one. That's how. Next is analyzing the data. You make sense out of the data. You see certain trends. Uh, if you do a research, you collect some data, and you will find some things like men are more prevalent uh, with these conditions or women are more likely to have such kind of uh, such kinds of symptoms and so on uh, then is interpreting the data making sense out of it finding out how it supports or it rejects your hypothesis and what does it mean the data what does it indicate about maybe the phenomenon you're studying next is uh, reporting re research findings that is the end part wherein you say the conclusion you state the conclusion saying that this is what I found by doing so and so and so on. There are also certain steps uh, below it, but they are kind of subsets of it. So this is collecting the data, finding out uh, you can do it in various ways. You can uh, maybe uh, the ones uh, who used to be there in psychology, in TY psychology, my seniors, they used to collect uh, physical forms. They used to make the participants used to come to the lab. They used to make them sit and they used to make them write all the responses, select all the responses. I unfortunately could not do that because during my time, we had to send out uh, virtual forms, Google forms. So we did not know that if the person is filling the information genuinely or is the person's state of mind uh, adept or uh needed for the kind of research that i'm doing usually the person the participant who is, uh, is supposed to be calm when they're filling out the forms but if the person is angry or maybe has some kind of pain in their body then uh, their mental state can change and the way they respond to the questions can also differ okay so this is just what i explained analyzing the data and making sense out of it 
seeing the trends, finding out what the data indicates about uh, various uh, phenomena. Yeah. Now reporting the findings. Reporting, uh, yeah, it is something the way you uh, kind of summarize what you have found. Abstract is the entire summary of a research paper. Reporting the findings is just a conclusion line that this is what I found and this is what it is. Uh, is somebody's mic on? Oh, thank you. Uh, now there is statistics, the results that we obtain. Now they are described uh, in two ways. One is a descriptive statistics and the other one is an inferential statistics. Now when, whenever you receive data, you uh, see what kind of trends there are. You calculate the total, the mean, the median, the range, and so on. That is descriptive. You're describing the data. What is the mean? What is the mean age of people who are suffering or maybe having this kind of condition? And inferential statistics is making sense, drawing conclusion in a way that uh, you can use Pearson product moment correlation, linear regression, that uh, help you in an understanding if whether or not the uh, IV is causing the DV. All right. Next is the discussion. That is the way you report your findings. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't need to be very long. You have to just uh, whatever tables you use to uh, maybe reflect the data you've calculated. You need to put it very formal using uh, diagrams, using tables, using pie charts that so and so percentage of people are having this variable in excess or so on. So that is summarizing. Next, giving your interpretation. What is it that you expected? And what is it that you found? And how do you explain what you have found? Sometimes you will get results that are contrary to what you must have expected from the results. And this is the place where you try to explain why did you find certain anomalies in your research. Then discuss the implication. The entire uh, purpose of uh, doing a research is to find out what the variables is, what the variables are, and how they're interrelated, as well as finding out the ways in which this study can be used to make it, say, uh, accessible to other people, other researchers, so that they can learn something from it. They can use it in their organizations. They can uh, maybe use this data to say that this research was done by so and so person in this year and this is the phenomena that uh, they have found out and these are the relations all right now every study has certain limitations limitations can be due to the fact that every study is supposed to be very natural and every study has some of the other flaws maybe the uh, sample size was too small or maybe the sample size was too large so it cannot be if the sample size is too small then it cannot be generalized the results cannot be generalized to an entire population or maybe uh, in my case the limitation was that the uh, as i already mentioned that uh, i it was sent online and i don't exactly know whether or not people have filled it genuinely or in a calm state of mind and there are future suggestions. So this is for people who will be conducting your own research in future. If you, uh, if I studied resilience, uh, the relationship between resilience and job stress, then what is it that I would like to suggest someone in the future to improvise in my study that I couldn't? So there are, of course, suggestions which can be uh, used at the very end then the final part is the references i know all of it seems to be very tedious but all of it is very important uh, this is the last part this is the references references means that you are uh, using the citation that you had provided earlier in the text above and you are showing where you had taken it from so it needs to be in apa format okay and the last part is plagiarism plagiarism is copying someone else's work and you cannot do it or uh, cannot intentionally always do it sometimes maybe you try to summarize someone uh, someone's uh, research paper and there might be certain words that you need to change in order to make sure that uh, your words and the, pers the person who originally wrote it does not have exactly the same kind of uh, words so you need to ensure that there is zero plagiarism or least amount of plagiarism that is possible 
these are the steps that you can take to uh, avoid plagiarism you can always credit the author that uh, this is something that i have used from someone else so it is a good thing because you will use definitions you will use formal uh, terms or maybe very uh, big definitions from somewhere online and you have to cite that this is not something by me this is something that is taken from an online source and it is only for the sake that uh, the person who is reading the research paper gets an improved understanding of the research or the variables now always keep track of what are you doing what are you uh, referring to and you can always use a plagiarism checker and these are some of them you just have to copy paste certain parts of your research paper like you just drag it down copy it and then go to these websites and paste it over there there will be a box so that is what you can do now uh, before we move on to uh, my research paper i would like to note is there anything that you would like me to repeat or is there anything that you did not understand before we move on I'm glad that uh, most of you all have got what I've uh, said, and that's good. So we move on to my research paper, all right? Just a minute. Okay, so this is my research paper. It is about 19 pages long and it is worth uh, 20 marks. It, it, this is my SEM 5 paper. My SEM 6 paper, the one uh, which I uh, had done um, on with a lot of with a lot many calculations and with a lot many variables is under publication, so I could not use that. This is a much simpler one and much easier to understand because uh, SEM6 papers have certain uh, variables, have certain dimensions to them that are quite uh, difficult to grasp, especially in the beginning. So beginning with my research paper, uh, I believe some of you are using phone. Uh, so I'll uh, zoom it so everybody can see it. Is this all right or can you see it now? Let me know if you want me to if you want me to zoom it more if in case nobody uh, all right so impact of resilience on the job stress as you can see the first line this one is the title of my uh, research uh, here I have uh, introduced both my variables resilience job stress as well as I've introduced the sample employees all right and the relationship that I want to study that is of resilience on job stress, IV on DV. So the first one is Dr. Migna Basutaku, she being the main author, uh, and that's me, Nandish Gwardia, and that's Bhavi. Bhavi was a senior to me, and uh, each of us have our designations written below our names, and the names need to be bolded. Uh, it needs to show the title, title page needs to show what organization we come from. Apparently, it's our college with the uh, the pin code. And this sentence is quite important because if any person reads this research paper, then they might have certain questions or they might want to collaborate. They might want to ask certain questions to the author. So this is a sentence that we write that correspondence concerning the research paper is to be addressed to Dr. Meghna Basu Thakur at her uh, email ID. Next, we move on to the abstract. As I had said, this is the abstract. And uh, I would like everyone to just read it. I want you all to understand that my entire research paper has been summarized in this abstract. Just a minute. Is this perfect? Okay, let me know when, once you're done reading it. There's just one more sentence, but I cannot zoom out uh, more of it. Just go through it once.
Okay, I believe someone has a message that you're done because I could hear the sound of the message, because, but I cannot see it. So I believe everyone has. Can anyone tell me what is it that you have understood? It's uh, just, just tell me, like, what is it that you understand from my research? Because this is the first thing that you will read when you open my document. Anything, like anyone can try it. Maybe you notice something that uh, you did not understand and you want to ask me, then go ahead. Oh, could you just give a brief introduction of what is linear regression? Yeah. So linear regression is basically uh, it's a complex kind of uh, calculation method that you use to find out whether or not there is a cause and effect uh, relationship between the variables. So if resilience and job stress are my variables and I found out that uh, there is a correlation between them, that the higher the person uh, is resilient, the lesser the job stress they will experience. Now this is the correlation. Correlation does not tell me whether it is resilience only that is causing the person to experience uh, lesser job stress. So I need to conduct a linear regression to find out that uh, resilience, it is only resilience or maybe there are high chances of resilience being one of the causes that there is a lower job stress. Is that understood? Or do you... Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. Okay, so as you all can see, this is the abstract. Here I have included an entire summary of what my research is about. What is a problem statement? All right, look at the very first sentence. I have in, uh, introduced what is the problem that I'm studying? What are my variables? What is uh, the number of uh, people that I have assessed for this research? It is 150 people, 150 employees from private sector uh, using an online survey. Then uh, the tools that I use, by tools I mean the scales that I use, the questionnaires that I use to measure uh, the person's resilience, I use a resilience scale and to measure the person's job stress, the job stress that they experience, I use an Indian scale. I'll come to that again because having an Indian scale in your research paper, if your population or the sample you're studying is Indian, which it will be for most of you all, um, having an Indian scale to measure it is a very good thing. Now we come to the keywords. Below the abstract we mentioned the keywords. What are the keywords? Keywords are basically uh, the central words, the main crux of your research. What is the variable that is studying along with what kind of relationship is it that you are looking after? So it is resilience, job stress, employees coping with job stress. So if my paper, if this uh, paper were to be published and these keywords should be included, then the person who would be searching about say resilience and uh, work satisfaction or uh, resilience and coping with something, then my research paper would appear because it has those keywords. Here it is that I formally introduce my uh, Uh, research paper. So abstract was a summary. Now this is what is it and I'm, I'm doing and why am I doing it? Introduction. So the very first paragraph, uh, I've stated the problem in a uh, bit of a uh, explicit way. I have mentioned more of what the problem is. I have also introduced what resilience is and what job stress is and I had uh, reviewed some of the studies. So there is uh, this statement at the end of the first paragraph. It states that I have done some thorough work in it. And it is suggestive of the fact that I did gain some kind of insight from it. So I did not mention these points in the PPT because this is not something that is a very formal way of doing it. You can do it as you want. But this is what I found to be good in a way that it will be uh, self-explanatory if a person reads all of this and it would in turn give a better understanding of what I'm trying to study. In the next paragraph I have introduced what my first variable my IV is which is resilience. Now if you can see I have used these brackets all right in these brackets there is the name of the researchers who uh, studied that concept and uh, and they uh, made certain uh, conclusions out of it 
I went through it and I cited them. Like when I was, uh, you have to do a lot of study about your variables. Whenever you're, uh, you've decided to conduct some kind of a research, you need to have a very thorough understanding of what your variables are, what other researchers have said about them, what are the previous findings uh, regarding those uh, variables. So in my time, the, we were just told that we needed to um, base our research papers around industrial or organizational psychology. And I thought that job stress uh, would be a good point to start. And I went online and I found out that there were not many uh, studies, Indian studies that focused on maybe some protective factors that, uh, that can lead a person to experience lesser amounts of job stress. So I found resilience. You also will be told to, you know, find research topics by yourself and go online, try to search where is it that Indian data is lacking and uh, try to conduct the research on it. But there are also many other factors that you have to take into consideration before you choose the variables, which I will, uh, okay, yeah. This is job stress, my second variable. I have uh, introduced it, I have defined it, and I have mentioned the sources that I took my information from, whether it was CDC Center for Disease Control or maybe uh, United Nations website, or maybe some personal studies by some American or some British or Vietnamese or Irish authors, anyone. And one thing you need to notice is that all these uh, studies, all these um, citations, they're quite recent. See, 2003, 2002. These needs to uh, these information, uh, these this information that you take needs to be you know quite recent, not something that uh, happened quite a long time ago, and maybe in the 60s or 70s. You need to find uh, current data. This is where I've uh, introduced my second. Uh, variable job stress i've defined it i've uh, cited all the researchers i took my information from next point is where i the third paragraph is where i uh, established that how resilience and job stress are related to each other so uh, what kind of relationship has been found between them by past researchers and the last point is what is uh, the uh, research conclusion that I am expecting or why is it that I am doing this so this is the as you can see this one determining how resilience and job stress are related uh, yeah that one well, how it will help me in understanding how these um, two variables are related moving on to literature review this is the part which is uh, kind of tricky because you have to refer to a lot of data. You have to go online. You have to uh, download or maybe view something. Not everything is free. You have to, uh, they, they sometimes ask you to uh, maybe sign in or pay something, but don't do it. There are several other uh, websites that give you research papers for free. Um, like you, you can view it, you cannot download it. Sometimes you can just view it. So as I already said that there weren't many studies on resilience and job stress in an uh, Indian population. So I had to refer to international studies. So the first one is an Asian study. And notice all these dates. This is 2020, quite recent, 2018, as you move down, it uh, reaches to 2016, 2015, and that's it. Meghna Mamad herself tell you that don't refer to studies that are more than seven or eight years old. Refer to studies that are quite recent. Okay, so these are the studies that were uh, done on the same variables, resilience and job stress, or maybe some other variable was also uh, inspected during their research. And in each of the literature review, I have to mention what the name of the researcher was, as you can see. Then what is it that uh, they were studying, the title, then what was the population, uh, the number of it, 528 employees, and what was found out, what was the finding, what was the conclusion that they derived using that information. Yeah, so this is an Irish study, then, uh, 
Uh, yeah so one more thing as you can see that there are various studies done on counselors nurses and firefighters as well and i've mentioned all of it because when we talk about job stress it is not something that is uh, significant only to maybe a workplace environment that we usually imagine when we think about offices and workplaces it can also be firefighting it can also be a clinical place where nurses and doctors are there it can be a place where counselors are there and uh, yeah even school teachers this was a study on school teachers and the next one is the, the one on nurses and these are some of the asian studies one in china and the other one uh, also an asian one so if you are able to find out uh, research studies that were done in india in a quite a recent time then it's better that you can use those studies as well it can be a good point to start Next comes the methodology, as I uh, already introduced you to the uh, subtopics of it. First is the objective. You state what is it that you're studying, uh, says you all can read this. The aim of the study was to investigate uh, the effect of resilience on job stress in employees. Then there are variables. You need to uh, state what they are. Then there is the hypothesis. As you can see, there are two hypotheses. Uh, if there is more than one, more than one hypothesis, there is an E in it. Hypothesis. Uh, so the first one is uh, the null hypothesis, and the second one is the alternate hypothesis. So whenever you're studying something, you cannot just assume it in a one single way. You need to also assume that there is maybe no relationship between resilience and job stress. And at the same time, you also make an assumption that maybe there is an um, uh, impact of resilience and job stress. So I mentioned both of them, H1 and H2, hypothesis one and hypothesis two. Next is the sample. Sample, uh, for me, it was 150 employees. Uh, and I had made sure that 50% uh, of my data would be coming from males and 50% of my data from females. And uh, I had sent these forms to some of my friends who had been working. And they were from different sectors, and these are the main sectors. And I also mentioned what was the mean age of all the participants. Next is the research tools. As I said, tools or scales or questionnaires is one and the same thing. What is it that you're using to measure resilience or measure job stress? So to measure resilience, I had used uh, this resilience scale, RS. And one thing that you need to make sure is that whenever you go online to say, say if you want to study burnout, burnout is something that a person, that an employee experiences when the person is so much done with their work that they feel a lack of energy, lack of motivation uh, to do their work. That is burnout. So if you're doing a research on burnout, then there will be uh, certain. Uh, certain scale, certain questionnaires to, men, uh, to certain questionnaires to measure it, and you have to see which is the latest one, which is the one that is Indian, which is the one that is uh, that has a very good reliability and validity. That is something that you will study in testing and assessment. And this one thing, notice this Cronbach's Alpha 0.91. It needs to be high. It means the, uh, the test is very reliable. If I were to give the same person this test again after a few days, I will. Most of the time, times I will get the same results containing 25 items. Items means the questions. All right. The resilience scale, it was developed in 1993 by these researchers, and it has a very high reliability and it has 25 items, 25 questions. And the responses on the scale were from one to seven. And it's a Likert scale. You all know Likert scale, right? It is something that you measure. Uh, using certain points on a scale, like one representing never and seven representing always. In this case, it was uh, strongly disagree, to seven being strongly agree. Do you all have any questions up until now? Okay, so the next one is the new job stress scale. This is an Indian scale. It also had certain uh, it has a good reliability and it had sub scales, which means it measured job stress, but it also measured certain other features such as these. So I wasn't only studying resilience and job stress. I was also studying resilience and what are the factors that 
are associated with job stress, so role expectation conflict, co-worker support, and so on. Next is the procedure. Uh, as I said, that uh, the data collection was done online using Google Forms, and the demographic information such as age, gender, sector were all noted. They were the, these questions were asked in the form before the person started uh, selecting the answers, uh, what their name, or maybe just their initials were asked, such as for me it would be N K because certain people are not really comfortable revealing their identities. So uh, their age, their gender, and which sector do they belong to, and so on. Then I also mentioned that I had used Microsoft Excel to uh, calculate and make uh, some interpretations out of the data and the Pearson product moment correlation. Then comes the results. This is what I had found out. This is a descriptive one, which means that I had just calculated the uh, resilience score. Suppose my resilience score was somewhere between a particular number. Then I would add up uh, all the resilience Hi. scores, and this would be the total mean range SG variance. And these are the uh, subscales of new job stress scale. Next is the age, which is also mentioned. And then there is a sector wise distribution of employees. Then uh, yeah, these are all the correlations that I did. This is something that you will be taught. Uh, what p value is significant? If it is significant or is it non-significant? Ns linear regression. Uh, this is the result that I found after doing linear regression on my data. Then there is discussion. You explain each of the tables uh, by you know stating all of these words with reference to table one. We can see that the mean score is so and so, and uh, it states so and so about the population or maybe anything else. Um, yeah. So this is where I've explained figure one pie chart. There is table two, table three. I've explained it, and uh, here it is where I have explained, where I've interpreted that this is the meaning of the data. So if the resilience is high, the job stress is low. And after finding out that my results were significant, uh, we did a linear regression, and we found out that resilience does have an impact on the job stress, and it can also be a cause to a person experiencing more or less job stress. All right, and this is where I've mentioned other studies, uh, which uh, have done the same thing and have found the same results. So there is an Iranian study and a Californian study. Both of them have been mentioned over here. Next, there is limitations and suggestions of future research. Uh, so for me, it was uh, that I had used an online form. So the validity of the responses could not be ascertained. Then uh, the future research can also focus on one sector, one private sector, maybe architecture, fashion designing, or medical, or so on, law, or so on. Uh, so these are the just like uh, some of the recommendations. This is the practical application uh, that my study can uh, be used to train employees in resilience because resilience does have an impact on a on an employee's uh, experience of job stress. This is the conclusion where I state the final line. And these are the references that I've taken. Notice how I've uh, alphabetically arranged all of these references. They're supposed to be chronologically ordered. First comes C, T, and so on. And notice how uh, if three researchers having the same initial letter, and it's also according to the chronological order, A, E, and I. This is the end. And this is the plagiarism tool that I had used. I went onto this website. I copied some of my written work. I went onto the website. There was a box. I pasted it over there. And I just put on, I clicked on the uh, search for plagiarism button. And this is what I found, 0% plagiarism. 
these are the plagiarism reports you have to submit it as well uh, along with your um, research paper so that your teacher or someone else who opens it knows that you have not copied it from somewhere else or this is your own material this is something that you have worked on your own and the data and all the information that you've put in is valid and that's something and that's something that has come from you and your work all right so do we have any questions none all right uh, and you want to take over so if you all have any questions do let me know at the end of the session thank you so much Should I go ahead? yeah okay hi guys hope you guys are doing fantastic and this is i think the last of our alumni program thing that is going on so i'll be briefing you about uh, community service and how to you know use google classroom which i'm pretty sure you know more or less everything about but anyway so i think we should get right into it let me just share my screen All right. Is my screen visible? Just someone say yes because I can't see you guys. Yes, it's visible. Okay. Perfect. Mm. All right. So we'll be talking about community service. And okay. So wait just a second. Does anybody want to tell me what is community service? what do you understand from the term community service anybody just want to take a guess or should i just go ahead okay so well community service is basically giving back to society giving back to your community and in general doing everything to uplift people around you people who are not as privileged as you are or people who do not have access to various resources that you do and you know therefore in general how you are promoting the community around you or your community any other community whatever because after all we all are a part of this human race and it is our responsibility to you know uh, uplift everyone around us so let's just start with the presentation Okay, so what is basically community service? So it's very important for you guys to understand that this is unpaid work that you do. And it basically is for the benefit of those around you or organizations that you're working for. And they're basically NGOs or, you know, any nonprofit organizations that you want to work with or work for. And any opportunity that comes your way, you want to take that up, whatever it is. So, and... All of this comes under a lot of topics. So as you can see in the PPT, they've written that you can, you know, work at food banks and places of worship, recreation centers, homeless shelters, schools, etc. So there are lots and lots of places that you can volunteer at. And there are lots of things that you can do. So at least for our batch, um, I was a new student, right, in National College. So I joined the batch last year i mean for 2020 to 2021 and unfortunately we couldn't you know go in person to volunteer obviously because of the pandemic so we had to do online community service which was altogether a you know a whole different experience and i think we all learned a lot from it so i'll just get into it and you know explain to you and these are certain benefits that i think you all know there are psychological benefits because trust me i mean i've never done community service up till now like this was my first time doing actual communities community work and you know so i could actually experience what they're talking about in terms of psychological benefits in terms of 
improvement of your overall life satisfaction because you know your day goes by in terms of lectures attending lectures doing your assignments and lots and lots of you know study related work so it is important for you to have these kinds of experiences as well because you get to interact with so many so many new people and you know you know what they're going through you can share your thoughts with them they can share theirs with you this is how in general uh the community work takes place not in terms of conversations only but also in other aspects and there are of course social benefits and cognitive benefits as you can see then here are some other additional you know things that you you should know about it so community service helps connect to the community obviously so you're helping people that are in need and you know you're volunteering with these people because you recognize that there is a scope of upliftment in their lives and you wish to contribute to that upliftment upliftment so that is why you do this community work and it definitely helps build your career prospects and you know it uh, so basically i don't know if you guys know but in case you're all you all are planning to go abroad next year or whatever after your uh, bachelors then it is it comes very handy and you know it's very helpful it looks great on your resume that you've done community work because colleges definitely look into this like have you done something extracurricular in terms of giving back to the society what are you doing is it just purely academics because the, academics is not the only thing which is going to get you that admission right it's also tons and tons of co-curriculars extracurriculars and of course community service so when you see now what for our batch and yeah before i forgot to mention that this is for counseling psychology so it's divided into your usual 80 20 pattern your 80 marks is your you know everything the paper and all of that and 20 marks is for community service that you do so and we had to do 120 hours of community service for our semester 5 and semester 6 so basically in a year we had to finish off with our 120 hours and 120 hours looks very very good on you know when you're applying and in general basically that you can tell your employers or whoever for internships or wherever it is that this, this does come in handy because they ask you have you done any volunteering or you know have you done community service everywhere how have you given back to society so yes it definitely is that but this shouldn't be done keeping in mind that you want an admission abroad like you know that's absolutely wrong because this is something that has to be innate you have to think about it in terms of that it is rewarding to the people that you're doing this for as well as for yourself not in terms of any uh, academic you know from any academic perspective but rather from a more life fulfilling perspective so keep in mind that that's going to come in handy and then of course it raises social awareness because you know of course we read about a lot of things right we have our newspapers we have our applications that we have on our phones which gives us a lot of input from various you know but when you actually do community service you are engaging in with these people in real life right so you're talking to them you're getting to know them you're listening to their life experiences maybe they won't have anyone to talk to and you are their you know sort of ray of sunshine whatever you want to call it and you know uh, it's it's really fulfilling i mean uh, and this is how you on your end raise social awareness right because you've done it now i've done community service uh, whatever i've learned from it i tell my parents you know like this is what i did this is what i learned therefore they learn it via me like you know so that is how you in terms of raising social awareness have an impact on the society and uh, community service establishes contacts and friendships like for sure i mean this one place that i volunteered at you know uh, i think in my semester 5 we i volunteered with old people so and it was just for semester 5 like i uh, didn't volunteer after that for my semester 6 i volunteered somewhere else but uh, so the organization that i volunteered at uh i made so many like you know acquaintances or friends friendships whatever you want to call it because these people that i spoke to and it was online right so had their phone numbers they had my cell number whatever so they still message me you know how are you doing beta and it's it's really nice i mean genuinely like someone's checking up on you that you you know help them out whatever it was so yeah in general that's 
an addition to it and of course community service helps improve your skills so if you're an introvert you don't like talking to people or you know in general in a group of people whatever you can do community service which involves one on one interaction so if you're you know not into group related interactions or you don't want to take part in those it is very much uh, helpful you know it it's going to enhance your communication skills uh and as well as you know intersocial skills interpersonal skills and all of this so in general it's it's a lot of uh what should i say like your entire persona is also developing when you're doing community work because it's not something that you do for yourself you do you do it for others and what you get is something you know some fulfillment life satisfaction ease and you know you're a little less stressed because your day goes about you in general i'll tell you some examples later on and now if you want to know where you can volunteer uh, personally like you know i've volunteered at jyotirmay and i've volunteered at yasham so yasham is basically they uh, have people like old people and all so i volunteered with them where i you know uh so a lot of old people nowadays and since of course there's the advent of technology and they need help right and we since we know a lot about technology how to use whatsapp or just the basic things you you telling them you know how to use zoom how to use google meet so that even when they want to use it with someone else they can and this really helps them to learn about you know uh technology and stuff because that is what they really want to know because you know they might have children who don't live here who might be residing abroad and you know they just want to know how to go about it so that helps and then of course there are other things also that you can do with them not just technology related stuff lots of lots and lots of activities if you want to you know have a game of antakshari play a game of antakshari with them you can do that anything that they like anything that's going to uplift their mood or and you know something that that's going to be very fun for both of you all to do and just things like that then i volunteered with jyotirma as well so you know they have uh you know adults with disabilities whatever it is like you know down syndrome or anything these type of people so we volunteered with them and that was a whole different experience i mean every day our lectures used to get over i think at uh 2 o'clock if i'm not wrong and after 2 o'clock we had our community service from 2:30 to 3:30 i guess and uh that one hour was so fulfilling because and that was not one on one so we had like i think 10 to 12 of them you know that we were interacting with we were having those activities with and it was all types of stuff like you know right from doing basic mathematics teaching them some english and uh telling them stories listening to their stories and just in general a lot of one on one face to face interaction doing worksheets solving solving a lot of sums uh telling time and you know all of this so of course these are very you know menial things for us but it's not for them right and when you are teaching them this stuff and it's adding to their knowledge or you know they're lear- learning something out of it then you get a lot out of it like you know in terms of fulfillment or whatever you are looking for in general so yes i think i've covered pretty much and these other organizations that you can see on the screen are where the other students have also volunteered at i have not so in case you want to check them out for your community service and of course it's n- not that you have to uh, volunteer at a particular organization after all community service can be done anywhere any place and of course like megna ma'am will tell you you know what are the uh, requirements or you know anything that is off limit or you know whatever it is so that will be cleared so no issues about that um i think i've covered pretty much of it are there any questions on your end that you would want clarification on in terms of doing community service or you know anybody nobody so should we go ahead okay great so we just have like a small bit of you know google classroom so i'm just going to share that 
Okay, so about Google Classroom, it's it's genuinely very basic. So I'm just gonna run through it. If you have any doubts, then let me know. So you know you have to join classes, right? So you your teachers will either they'll send you an uh, invitation that you can accept, or they'll give you a class code that you have to enter and then join the class. And there's this menu button. I'll show you uh, really quickly after this that you can navigate your classes between, and you know you can check your uh, assignments, whatever. And if you want to change any settings, all of that can be done using the menu button. So. Then there is, of course, Google Classroom's entire point is that their teachers are going to give you assignments. Now that we have, you know, online learning and all of this, uh, that is why we're not going to submit any handwritten, you know, assignments in person, right? So it's going to be all online. So they're going to ask you now, maybe like, you know, as Nandesh previously explained, the research paper that is also supposed to be like for us, at least we did it online. So we put it on the word format and, you know, whatever, and we submitted it um, online and via these Google classrooms, basically. So, and your the home screen, it has all the names of your classes, like, and along with the names of the teachers, like, you know, uh, now for us, we had Shweta ma'am, so we had her class and her name displayed. So those uh, windows had assignments as well, like displayed on them. And you can click on those assignments and see the upcoming assignments that you have, that, you know, whatever are due. And the time will also be given. So, for example, if it's like 11.59 p.m. Tuesday, then you're supposed to submit it by tonight, like, you know, before the clock strikes 12, because that's very important. Like, even if you're like one minute late, it's not OK. Like, just make sure that you're submitting on time. And um, then yeah i think of course like you you i think you guys will be using your official uh, institutional ids that i have been given to you for you know accessing these classrooms and the classes in general so you'll get a notification on those uh, mail ids like you know if your uh, assignment is due or you, the teacher has reviewed and uh, given it back to you like as in they've graded it given you your marks and you can view it as well as access it whatever it is so no issues about that either and then you can communicate with the teachers so you can you know post comments attachments any youtube videos links to the class stream if the teacher is going to ask you like you know if in case they tell you that, oh, we saw this video in the class, can you please post it on the classroom so that everyone can view it, then you can do that. And you can directly communicate with the teacher, like where the assignment section is, I think. There's the comment section as well. So you can like comment whatever you, if if there are any doubts, any questions, whatever. But yes, it is a hard and fast rule that please, please, please avoid all sorts of unnecessary communications because this will not be good in terms of, you know, uh if it's not academic and in general if you can clear these doubts in class then that's a sort of more better thing because classrooms are otherwise it becomes complicated so anyway uh yeah un unless and until you know the teacher has told you that okay you can reach out to me on the classroom then please do so but if not then just avoid it because you guys have the online mode of communicating like via the google meet so f just do that and yeah i think that was pretty much about it so are there any questions from your end no so are we good to go okay so nandish is there anything else left i think we've covered pretty much everything about it right Please yeah i believe so too and oh. if they don't have any questions then i guess we can call it off yeah okay perfect so okay guys so we've covered research papers you know how to write a research paper and community service and google classrooms so hope you have understood everything and in case you haven't you can you know ask questions whatever it is so we're here to answer that right now and uh in case you don't hope this was a little insightful i mean even if you knew pretty much everything about it little addition here and there so yeah have a great year ahead and good luck with everything it's going to be a roller coaster so have fun okay then you can log off and we'll see you maybe whenever all right bye bye